Today we'll talk about one of the most influential politicians, maybe even the most influential politician, of the German Democratic Republic, Walter Ulbricht. Hi and welcome to another East Germany Investigated video. The German Democratic Republic, the GDR, existed only 41 years, which means that the number of high-level politicians is very limited. It's not hard to spend one hour talking about Walter Ulbricht, but to keep it interesting, in this video I will focus on the most important periods in his life. Walter Ernst Paul Ulbricht was born on June 30th, 1893, in Leipzig. His parents, as well as his grandparents, were workers and craftsmen. Befitting his social status, in 1907, Walter Ulbricht starts an apprenticeship as carpenter. During this time, he became involved in socialist and labor movements, which would shape his political beliefs and activism. At the age of 20, he becomes a member of the Socialist Party, SPD. He gives lectures to young people about the youth movement and works on his self-development by reading and participating in courses. During the First World War, Ulbricht needs to fight as an infantryman for the Imperial German Army in Macedonia and Serbia, and his political activities come to a temporary standstill. In 1920, Ulbricht becomes a member of the Communist Party of Germany, the KPD, where he actively creates, prints and distributes party leaflets and leads a training course of young party members. In that same year, he also marries his first wife, Mata Schmelinski. His illegal party activities make him a wanted man. Because of a warrant issued against him, he cannot stay with his wife and his newborn daughter. In the 1920s, Ulbricht slowly but surely gets higher positions in the KPD. He also spends several years in Moscow, working for the Communist International, the Comintern, a Soviet organization to promote world communism. Ulbricht doesn't have any identifiable weaknesses, like smoking or drinking. He doesn't have any friends, and is an introvert. He is known for his stubbornness. In 1930, he is elected to the Reichstag for the second time. His biggest opponent, the National Socialist Joseph Goebbels. A year later, Ulbricht also plays a role in the murder of the two police captains, Paul Anlauf and Franz Lenk. More details about this in the video about Erich Mielke. As the National Socialist Party, the NSDAP, comes to power in Germany in 1933, Ulbricht, like many other communists, flees to the Soviet Union to escape persecution. He spends the main part of the Third Reich period from 1933 till 1945 in Moscow, Paris and Prague, working for the KPD. He often removes people out of his way by just reporting their mistakes. Mainly because of this tactic, in 1937 he manages to become the head of the Secretariat of the Central Committee of the KPD. A position at the top from which he, in Paris, directly reports to the KPD chairman Wilhelm Pieck at the Executive Committee of the Comintern in Moscow. But the same games Ulbricht uses against others to get in that position are used against him. So he doesn't stay in the position for even a year, and he is ordered back to Moscow, where he stays until the end of the war. In March 1943, he receives a decoration for his activities at the Stalingrad frontline, where he spread propaganda to the German soldiers by means of dropped leaflets and speeches through loudspeakers, trying to convince the soldiers to defect, with only limited success, by the way. In May 1945, Ulbricht returns to Germany as leader of the Gruppe Ulbricht, the first group of 10 German KPD members to return from Moscow to Germany. Almost immediately, Ulbricht begins working on a restart of the KPD, but that doesn't turn out to be an easy job. The KPD members are now divided into three camps with different ideas. The ones that stayed in Germany over the past 12 years, the ones that had emigrated to the West, and the ones that had spent their time in Moscow. Based on the results of elections in Austria, where communists suffered an electoral defeat, Stalin orders to speed up the unification of communists and social democrats, because otherwise he would lose his influence on Germany. Ulbricht gets the job done, and in April 1946 the SED, Sozialistische Einheitspartei Deutschlands, the Socialist Unit Party of Germany, is founded. Although it officially should look like a merger of the communist KPD and the socialist SPD, the SED party would in reality be run by the communists. The social democrats would either give up, would be deprived of their power, or would be excluded from the party and even thrown in jail. 
Building a socialist system in the whole of Germany is Ulbricht's aim in life. But in May 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, was founded. And as agreed in advance with Stalin, that would mean the foundation of the German Democratic Republic. Ulbricht is appointed General Secretary of the Central Committee of the SED, the most powerful man in the GDR. With his growing self-importance, Ulbricht regularly makes individual decisions, not informing the Politburo, the highest decision-making body of the GDR. He often forces his Politburo colleagues to take decisions without giving them any time to prepare, and he doesn't show any respect and treats them rudely. With this behavior, how could Ulrich stay in his position? An important reason is that at that time there was no one with the killer instinct that would want to take him down, although some would have had the opportunity to do so. Another reason is of course the support that Ulrich got from Moscow. In the previous decades he has proved himself to be a good and loyal communist. Also none of his rivals has that many contacts in Russia as Ulrich does. Ulbricht is a poor speaker. His high voice and Saxon dialect restrict his rhetoric. During his speeches he mostly looks at his text, not at the audience, and he makes a lot of mistakes. Ulbricht doesn't have any friends, and he is socially awkward, and with his Lennon-like beard he looks strange. At birthday parties, while everyone is dancing and having fun, Ulbricht is sitting in the corner doing his personnel planning. He is always on duty. Ulbricht makes long days. While others have symptoms of fatigue, Ulbricht stays wide awake. He is interested in every topic, from architecture to art, economics to labor unions, and sports to agriculture. Ulbricht is a good listener and asks questions, which gives him the advantage of always being better informed than his fellow comrades. And he wants to know every detail. If necessary, he reads piles of documents during the night in order to be well prepared for the next day. During most meetings it would simply go like this. The one who brought up the agenda item would report. Then Ulbricht would express his opinion and gave instructions how to proceed. In 1952 it becomes clear that a reunification with West Germany will not be happening according to Stalin's conditions. So Stalin decides that the GDR should create an army and change the border to West Germany into a, as Stalin says, dangerous one. Stalin also says that the GDR must move towards socialism, but the word socialism should not be mentioned. Ulbricht, however, decides that the new slogan for the upcoming second SED party conference is Vorwärts für Frieden, Einheit, Demokratie und Sozialismus, ahead with peace, unity, democracy and socialism. During the conference, Ulbricht holds a long speech in which he states that socialism will be established according to schedule. He gets a long applause and standing ovations. On March 5, 1953, Stalin dies. Ulbricht's great example. There are a lot of similarities between both men. They were weak on rhetoric, but bold, and in situations of crisis even cold-blooded. They trusted no one. Political opponents were eliminated whenever possible. They both lived simply and didn't need any luxury. They both had organizational talent, assertiveness and the absolute will to power. To Ulbricht, but also to the other SED leaders, Stalin's death is a deep shock. But this is not the only setback that Ulbricht has to deal with that year. The uprising in June will almost cost him his job. On the 30th of June, Ulbricht will turn 60 and preparations for his birthday are in full swing. There will be books and even a movie about Ulbricht's life. But the East Germans are not in a party mood. Over the last period, a lot of measures restricting people's freedom have been implemented. Mostly farmers are affected, related to the foundation of agricultural production cooperatives, but also the possibilities to travel to the West and the freedom of churches are restricted. And what affects most people are the so-called work quotas. People have to work longer for the same money, which at the end means lower wages. And on top, prices go up. The Soviets are deeply worried and order Ulbricht and Grotewohl, the minister-president, to prepare for a change of course, before it's too late. Especially Lavrenti Beria, first deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers and head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of the Soviet Union, is a resolute opponent of Ulbricht, saying that he is a man that doesn't understand anything and doesn't love his people. Ulbricht is clearly in trouble and possibly about to be discharged. Suddenly, many members of the Politburo dare to speak up and express their opinion about Ulbricht, complaining about his dictatorship. But they forget or don't realize that Ulbricht is resentful. 
If someone criticizes him, he will remember it and wait for the moment to pay back. A so-called new course, Neuer Kurs, is announced in the press on June 12th that contains a number of measures such as travel facilitations to the West, a bit more freedom to the churches, and for the farmers, the forced collectivization is for the time being put on hold. However, nothing positive is mentioned about the work quotas, which will turn out to be one of Ulbricht's biggest mistakes. It comes to a big strike in Berlin on June 16th. The people want to see Ulbricht, but he states that this Politburo meeting is more important and that it's raining so the people will leave soon anyway. But that doesn't happen. People start shouting, Spitzbart, Brauch und Brille sind nicht des Volkes Wille. Goatee, belly and glasses are not the will of the people. The people want Ulbricht to step down. Finally, under pressure, the Politburo decides to reduce the work quotas. But the people have completely lost their confidence in the GDR government and want free elections, so the day after they plan an even bigger strike. In the evening, Ulbricht invites SED party officials from the Berlin region and explains more details of the new course, completely ignoring what has happened that day. This is one of Ulbricht's weaknesses. He simply ignores critical things that he doesn't like. On the morning of June 17th, when crowds of people are already gathering on the streets, Ulbricht and the other Politburo members are picked up and brought to Karlshorst, the office of the Soviet Control Commission, passing lots of groups of furious people along the way. As of that moment, the Soviets make the decisions and bring the uprising to a bloody end. More about this in the German Uprising video on this channel. Ulbricht again survives because his opponents do not have sufficient determination to overthrow him. And in particular, in Moscow, Beria is declared an enemy to the party, dismissed and excluded from the party and sentenced to death. Ulbricht's biggest enemy of the last months is suddenly gone. In the period after the uprising, Ulbricht takes revenge on the Politburo members that have been too critical. Especially Rudolf Hernstadt, who also is chief editor of the newspaper Neues Deutschland, and Wilhelm Zeisser, also Minister of State Security. Accusations against them go even that far that they would be imperialistic agents wanting to introduce capitalism in the GDR. Both are expelled from the party. Ulbricht's resentment shows when he even sends Hernstadt to work for the German Central Archive in Merseburg, an area with high air pollution because of the heavy chemical industry, while he knows that Hernstadt had suffered from tuberculosis that left him with only 50% of his lung capacity. Also, Anton Ackermann and Eli Schmidt need to leave the party. As part of the so-called new course, Neue Kurs, consumer prices are lowered and wages are increased. Also the Soviets make some economic concessions, such as waiving the remaining 2.5 billion dollar of war reparations. However, in the GDR, not even a year later, there was almost nothing left of the new course. Also in 1953, Ulbricht marries his second wife, Lotte Kuhn, who had been his partner since mid-1930s already. Lotte Kuhn is fluent in Russian, which from time to time is very useful to Ulbricht, who doesn't speak the language so well. In February 1956, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev holds his secret speech in which he knocks Stalin from his pedestal, mainly related to the purges in the 1930s, where at least 700,000 people had lost their lives. The speech was a shock to the many Stalin admirers. Ulbricht, who had still honored Stalin in each and every of his own speeches, doesn't show any emotion and states that Stalin was not a classic. Ulbricht is forced to admit that reforms are necessary also in the GDR and he rehabilitates 73 SED members, a part of which had earlier been deprived of their power by Ulbricht himself, such as Anton Ackermann and Eli Schmidt. Stalin relics are removed quietly, Stalinstadt becomes Eisenhüttenstadt, the Stalin Allee in Berlin becomes Karl Marx Allee and the Stalin statue in the middle of that street is removed during the night. Within the Central Committee, more and more members lose the political battle against Ulbricht. In the autumn of 1957, Minister of State Security Ernst Wollweber, Minister of Culture Johannes Becher and Secretary of Culture and Education Paul Wandel resign. Now Ulbricht has only two enemies left in his Central Committee. Karl Scherdewan, Secretary for Cadre Affairs and Gerhard Ziller, Secretary for Economic Policy. Ulbricht increases the pressure on Scherdewan, who, much too late, starts looking for allies to collectively bring Ulbricht down. Gerhard Ziller then makes a huge mistake. During a lunch where he has drunk too much, he shouts that he and Scherdewan will tell Ulbricht the truth. 
he'd better prepare himself. Via a Stasi employee, Ulbricht is informed and he indeed prepares the meeting well. Sherdewan is forgotten to be invited by Ulbricht, but he appears in the meeting anyway, and Siller is accused of expressing criticism against SED leaders. The meeting will resume the next morning, but during the night of December 14, 1957, Gerhard Siller commits suicide. When Siller's widowed wife asks Ulbricht why, Ulbricht says, we didn't tell him to do this. Sherdewan has no chance to win the battle. In February 1958, he and Fred Oelsner, deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers, are excluded from the Central Committee. Sherdewan is degraded to leader of the State Archive. Ulbricht rewards Erich Honecker for his loyalty. He takes over the responsibilities from Sherdewan. Now having eliminated all his enemies in the party, Ulbricht will be the absolute ruler till his replacement in 1971. If Ulbricht's opponents would have had a bit more courage, they could have overthrown him and made use of the helping hand of Khrushchev. As mentioned, Ulbricht was a man without a private life. However, sports are his big passion, and he had a daughter. In 1946, he and his then still future wife Lotte Kuhn adopt an orphan girl, Beate, from the Soviet Union. According to Beate's statements, the relationship with her father was normal, like a normal family. He played with his daughter, read bedtime stories, almost if we were talking about another person. Beate Ulbricht was found dead under mysterious circumstances in 1991. The open border around West Berlin is a big thorn in his side, and in March 1961, Ulbricht brings it up in a meeting of all Warsaw Pact states. None of the participants, including Khrushchev, approve Ulbricht's idea to close the Berlin border or even to use barbed wire, not wanting to risk a war with the United States. Ulbricht, however, when back in Berlin, orders Erich Honecker to start preparing the closure of the border. Three months later, in a press conference, Ulbricht is asked if he plans to close the border at the Brandenburg Gate. He most probably makes a slip of the tongue by answering that nobody has the intention of building a wall. Niemand hat die Absicht, eine Mauer zu Although no one asked him about a wall, but which is exactly what happens in the night of August 13th, 1961. A few days earlier, Ulbricht had gotten final approval from the Eastern Bloc states, stating that fleeing GDR citizens weaken the GDR economy, and the weak GDR economy will also affect their economy. And indeed, the closure of the last loophole leads to a positive impulse to the East German economy in the next years. Life standard reaches the highest level of all communist states in the world. But in the same time, dozens of people lose their life trying to escape from the GDR. In 1963, Ulbricht turned 70 and unlike 10 years ago, it is widely celebrated. The Soviets grant him two medals, the Hero of the Soviet Union and the Order of Lenin. In October 1964, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev is replaced by Leonid Brezhnev, a man that is less open to reforms. As of the first meeting with Brezhnev, it is clear to Ulbricht that from now on it will be less easy to ask the Soviets for a favor. Mid-1960s, the GDR still isn't recognized as an independent state. Ulbricht works hard to have this changed. After years of preparations, in 1969, Iraq is the first non-communist country that starts diplomatic relations with the GDR. Soon Cambodia, Sudan, Syria, Egypt and Algeria follow. But also West Germany is still in Ulbricht's focus since the 1950s, having a unified Germany in mind. A socialist Germany, of course. He even includes this in the new GDR constitution in 1968. Ulbricht hopes to succeed in the unification together with the West German Socialist Party, the SPD. The Soviets, however, make clear that if contacts are made to West Germany, it has to be done by the Soviets and not by Ulbricht. But as usual, Ulbricht doesn't do what he is told. Finally, in 1970, inner German negotiations start, resulting in a contract two years later. At the end of the 1960s, Walter Ulbricht has become a sort of living monument of world communism. His people do their best to present him the version of reality that he expects to see, just to please him. This means that in case Ulbricht would visit a certain place in the country, people would work day and night to get everything prepared down to the finest details. Ulbricht's character has developed to a point that many describe as unbearable, mainly because of his bossiness and ego problems. Ulbricht sees himself at the level of Lenin and Stalin. He even lectures the Soviets, including Soviet leader Brezhnev, about the successes of the GDR economy and the GDR being exemplary in socialism. This would prove to be a serious mistake. 
Also, Ulbricht's health is deteriorating. He regularly is hospitalized and needs time to recover. Despite Ulbricht's reform attempts, in the beginning of the 1970s, the general supply situation in the GDR is still insufficient and the country has gotten into a financial crisis. People are mainly dissatisfied about the housing conditions, but also the availability of kindergarten and daycare places, the road conditions and the functioning of the government bodies. Ulbricht does not change his course. In the course of 1970, two meetings with West Germany take place, after which the Soviet Union orders the GDR to stop not having confidence in the Western terms and conditions. Ulbricht, however, does not follow Brezhnev's requirements and even openly communicates in the media that he hopes that a third round of talks will lead to the start of a diplomatic relationship between the two German states. Erich Honecker makes use of the distance between both leaders. Ulbricht has been Honecker's mentor and has brought him where he is now, but he has to withstand more and more attacks from Ulbricht. Time has come for Ulbricht to make room for a new leader. But that is not an easy job. In an extra Politburo meeting on July 1st, 1970, the day after Ulbricht's 77th birthday, Honecker is removed from his post. But not for long, because when Brezhnev hears about this, he immediately sends his East German ambassador to Ulbricht with a clear message to have Honecker reinstalled, which happens a few days later in the next Politburo meeting. The combination of his bad health and the lack of support from his Politburo members has driven Ulbricht into isolation. In January 1971, Erich Honecker sends a letter to the Soviet Communist Party demanding Ulbricht's resignation, in order to avoid that Ulbricht will cause irrecoverable damage to the party. The letter is signed by 13 out of the 21 Politburo members. Three months later, Honecker is given the green light from Moscow and drives to Ulbricht's country estate at the Dönsee. He is well prepared and he even has arranged for all telephone lines to Ulbricht being cut and asks his personal security staff to bring automatic weapons. But things don't get out of hand. After a 90 minutes heavy argument, Ulbricht gives up and signs his letter of resignation. As requested by the Soviets, Ulbricht becomes honorary president of the SED and remains chairman of the state council. Erich Honecker now is the first secretary of the SED. During the first months after he stepped down, Ulbricht's health quickly deteriorates. He has several circulatory collapses and heart attacks. But when doctors want to stop him from going back to work, Ulbricht thinks that this is all prearranged in order to remove him from politics. The loss of his power and isolation makes him even more frustrated. Honecker continues to finish what he started, making sure that Ulbricht loses his complete power. On the next party congress, Honecker openly criticizes Ulbricht's bossiness. In September 1971, he even shares Ulbricht's medical file amongst the members of the Central Committee, trying to convince everyone that Ulbricht has only got weeks to live. Ulbricht sends several letters to Brezhnev, sharing his long list of complaints and asking the Soviet leader to intervene, which doesn't happen. Due to his medical condition, his activities decrease in number. Ulbricht's last public performance is on June 30th, 1973, his 80th birthday. He asks Honecker, who is the speaker, if he can remain seated. One month later, on the 1st of August 1973, Ulbricht dies due to heart failure. Contrary to the assumption that Ulbricht's funeral would be a silent one, it becomes a state funeral, based on Soviet orders. The number of people participating in Ulbricht's farewell in the morning is higher than expected. The state act is visited by delegations from the Warsaw Pact states. Brezhnev sends his number two, the second secretary Nikolai Podgorny. Honecker holds a commemorative speech. After the state act, the coffin is transported on a military vehicle to the Baumschulenweg crematorium. Six weeks later, the urn is buried at the Memorial of the Socialists, the Gedenkstätte der Sozialisten, in Berlin Friedrichsfelde, next to Otto Grotewohl and Wilhelm Pieck. Walter Ulbricht is inextricably linked to the history of communism in Germany. His legacy was the German Democratic Republic. And that brings us to the end of today's investigation. Feel free to check the other videos on this channel and to subscribe. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.